We're going. We're officially going, Kelly. Jason, we are always going. Nice to see you, my friend. <laughs> nice to see you too, man. Congratulations on another Ava's Kitchen. And since we're talking about kids, you guys are amazing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Ashley, Ashley crushed it. You know, it's funny. Uh, the venue change was like twelve days in advance, but um, she made it happen, and we we were able to fundraise quite a bit for uh, kids fighting cancer and families. So we missed you. Uh, your you actually were generous, and you um, auctioned off an item, and uh, it performed really well. I got to see exactly what it did, but thank you for doing that. Well, of course it performed really well. If you have a chance to spend some one-on-one -on -one being tortured by me, I mean, who wouldn't want that? <laughs> who wouldn't want that? Speaking <laughs> of you and being tortured. So, you know, this is, this brings you up to, a, to me. And then I want to talk about kids and training. Um, you know, you and I were talking the other day and uh, I do want to talk about the blood flow restriction, but I want to mm. talk about quad smashing. So, you know, I was having really bad uh, knee pain right on top of my knee. And so much so it was like waking me up at night. And I really felt like, man, something was wrong. And I reached out to you and you're like, Hey, quad smash couch stretch. And it's so funny because like, literally those are like two very fundamental things. And so I thought maybe you could share with me what, what is the quad smashing actually doing? Because why was it so damn effective to heal my knee up? I, I, I want to, and then obviously the couch stretch is like a separate thing. Are they hitting the both the same areas? Well, first and foremost, what we're thinking is there are – when athletes and people are working really hard consistently, their tissues can get stiff, especially if that person ends up being a CEO kind of person where you are training really hard and then don't have the wherewithal or luxury to do tons of extra movements or get soft tissue mobilization. And so it's ended up to be stiff. And I think it's confusing because we tend to not want to – just address stiffness as a problem. I'm not talking about tightness. If you're weak, you can be tight for sure. Your body trying to solve a problem, but stiffness just happens. Look, after you train, the first thing that happens is your body starts laying down collagen. So it can handle the larger forces transmitted by the changes in the musculature that are going to come. But if you don't keep an eye on it, you can be super stiff. And I've seen you get into the couch stretch before, and I knew that your quads were stiff, that you were missing range of motion. So the first thing we can do without really addressing movement or technique or environment or lifestyle, say, well, hey, can we improve the stiffness or change the stiffness in the system? And turns out just putting something heavy on your quadriceps, breathing, contract, relaxing, doing isometrics, going side to side allows us to address stiffness. Now, here's the deal. We're not, you were saying you had pain, but I wasn't talking about trying to go after your pain. I was trying to talk about restore it, change or decrease the stiffness in your quads. Mm. So your brain could just have perceived the input as, oh, we've changed something. And so now the knee is not painful anymore. That works. That's valid. We could have re restored blood flow in there. We could have changed how that tissue was articulated with the changes around it. We could have changed your range of motion and prove that where the brain again once was like, this is cool. It could have been so painful that your brain was like, whoa, well, that's painful. I don't mean to make the knee painful anymore. But when we're trying to untangle complex pain in movement problems, right? I know it's not your technique. I know it's not your, your tissues. I know it's not your activity. I know it's not your sleep. So we start with the basics. Well, I think your quads are stiff. How do I know? Because you're missing range of motion. Let's work on improving your range of motion. So really the mobilization was just a way of addressing stiffness in the tissues. And if you get ever get Thai massage or some of these things, you'll see that the Chinese weightlifters spend a lot of time walking down on each other because of the level of stiffness that the loading is giving them. And you can see why it's confusing because if you laid on a roller for 30 seconds, you're like, didn't change anything. You're like, nope, didn't change anything. You need heavier loads for much more sustained time. And that was just the first order of business. Can we just change how the tissues are articulating with the neighborhood? Then the second thing with the couch stretch is basically end range isometric loading. I think you're missing hip extension. Let's put these tissues, including the knee, in a position where they're gonna be loaded when the hip is an extension like a lunge. And then you breathe there, you spend time there, your brain's like, oh, this is okay. Changes some aspect of the tissue system plus, we we're doing contract relax there, which are just different ways of doing isometrics. And lo and behold, suddenly your brain doesn't perceive that as threat. Why? Maybe it's blood flow. Maybe it's cha we changed the tension loading on it. Maybe we restored motion. Maybe we increased hydration, right? Maybe we changed the mechanic. All of those things are valid. But what works really well is 
hey, if your tissues are stiff or, or uncomfortable to compression, we can change that and improve that. And let's get you spending more time in the positions where you struggle in, in this case, hip extension, which is very common amongst our CEOs and perfect segue into our children. Because what I gave you was actually the recipe that I have for all kids who have things like Oshgood slaughters and some of the common musculoskeletal problems that kids have. They're not capsularly bound up. They're growing. Bones are growing super fast. Connective tissues are growing less fast. So we can address stiffness and get them comfortable living at some of these end ranges. And boom, that's how we solve some of these what seems like really intractable childhood musculoskeletal problems. And that couplet is our go-to couplet. So uh, before we move on to the kids, I, just to kind of re, re, reiterate on me, quad smashing in particular, what I found, what I found easy is taking like a, a kettlebell, just placing it right on the quad and yep. just sitting and breathing into it. That, that was like the, the um, kind of buried entry where basically I sat there, laid there, whatever, had a quad, had a, had a um, kettlebell on, on my quad for an extended period of time post-training. And how but, easy was that? You were warmed up. Kettlebells there. You, you could be at. You could lean up against the wall and talk to people. And suddenly, it made sense. It wasn't you on your stomach. The, like it's so easy. And we know that those tissues will change under large sustained loads. That's the deal. And and so I I found you know specific areas obviously that felt very like like you're, you're talking about the, they definitely required some level of compression on them and the loading, the, at least with the two poot, the 70 pounder, that was fine. Now, when I took it up a notch per your recommendation, I, I had never done this before. I thought it was a really cool idea where you have either your child or your wife or whoever, your significant other hold two chairs on the side and actually walk on the quad. So normally when I had done it in the past, it was a little bit sketchy because we hadn't utilized the chairs as a support system. So you only had like one side. And especially I've even done this on the back before. And it's like, oh shoot, if this person trips and falls, like this <laughs> could be really bad. I'm gonna break a lung. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And so, but 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 your recommendation of identifying two chairs and using that as your support system and then walking on it was like dramatically Im impactful. So I just wanted to share that today because the quad smashing started off with the kettlebell incorporated then the individual who's able to kind of roll their foot, but utilizing the chairs played a big role. So and, thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. And I want people to understand that this is one of the things that I want families to be able to do mm. is that kids. So Caroline is my, my 13 year old. She's an eighth grader. She's almost five ten. She's growing like a weed and playing a ton of water polo. And then she's a student. And when and where are her soft tissue needs addressed? They're not. We basically pretend like, oh, here's what the good practice or best practices look like at our elite athletes. They take care, they have massage, they have a physio team, they're working on mm. restoration. But we're like, no, 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 children, they don't obey the laws of nature. They're different. Well, and to, to pause you there for a second, I almost feel like it's it it seems okay because you look at these children, like particular, like let's just take my kids, their range of motion, their flexibility is, it, it doesn't look that bad. Um, I mean, most kids seem a lot more flexible than most adults. So I think they kind of like say, oh, well, we don't really need to work that, but maybe we're wrong to think that, especially as the kids start training more and more. Is that, is that what you're kind of alluding to? Yeah, a little bit? you know, and what I'm saying is, you know, if when we put kids into the couch position, these mm -hmm. this hip extension isometric, they fall apart. And, and they're the couch super position stiff. for the for those who aren't familiar, um, you know, like you were saying, a lunge position, but your rear foot is kind of propped up onto, you know, a couch or a wall, which which most people use, I think. Yeah, and what basically we're saying, hey, if you were in a lunge shape, we're taking your your leg is behind your body except the couch, we're just bending the knee. So we're right. basically taking all the slack out of the system from the knee, and then we're applying it through the hip extension and extending the hip like a lunge. And so it's like, a, like imagine the classic runner stretch where you grab one of your legs and you pull your heel to your butt. It's like that, except it actually works, right? So, right. and it actually finds the, the holes. So and have, has that been what you've been doing? So what have you been seeing? Cause I mean, your girls are at like perfect ages to watch kind of like the evolution because mm -hmm. they're in, you know, they're teens now. So it's like, you've been able to watch them grow and evolve and they're athletes. So how has that kind of changed your perception in regards to getting kids mobilizing or at least getting in these positions versus, you know, everything else they could be doing. So Georgia's water polo team at high school is on our app, uses our app. They put up, 
As part of the program, they'll put up one of our follow along videos. And then with a ball and a roller, that's as simple as it needs to be with kids sometimes. Ball and a roller plus some, some strength and conditioning movements. And when I say that, I'm talking about squat, hinge, push, pull, lunge, right? Basic stuff. But just teaching kids how to do some basic soft tissue mobilization. Because oftentimes it's because kids are so pliable and durable until something hurts they don't know it's a problem. So Caroline, for example, suddenly was like, hey, my hamstring is sore. And I was like, no problem. So I was like, lay down on the, you know, getting her, a 13-year-old, to be engaged with self-care and down-regulation. Like, she's like, dude, I got TikTok to do. I got my friends to hang out. So to answer your question, what we've found to be very useful is that if you your child reports something that hurts, that's a perfect time to step in and have a soft tissue intervention as a parent and using chairs and hands and feet. We teach all the teams we work with for kids to be able to help each other self soothe to address stiffness or pain. What do I do? If something hurts, we work upstream above it. We work below it. We contract, we relax, we teach them to breathe, you know, and we teach them to take care of the soft tissues for each other. And what you found out was that, man, it's low tech for me to lay my kid down, grab a couple chairs, and then just put some pressure going across the tissues. Like when you cut a flank steak, we cut mm. across the grain. Right. And that's what we're trying to do with some of this tissue is just restore how these tissues are articulating. And that may be enough to release tension, address stiffness, or even change how the brain is interpreting that as threat. Remember, Pain is a request for change. It doesn't mean you're injured. It doesn't mean there's tissue damage. It's a request for change. So when we rehydrate something or, or de-stiffify it or uh, increase blood flow in that area, that can be enough. So me standing on Caroline's hamstrings for a few minutes, you know, real at a, a pressure where she can take a breath, that's how we untangle this problem. We make the part of being an athlete means that you need to eat. Yes. You need to sleep. Yes. You need to be able to understand how to manage your time. Yes, this is why we love this. Well, also we're saying, hey, you need to learn how to take care of your tissues. What's stiff after today's workout? Great. Five minutes on your left calf, five minutes on your right calf. Hey, what's stiff after today's training session? My shoulder's great. Here's a ball. Let's do three minutes on your left shoulder and three minutes on your right shoulder. Pretty soon, kids are clever enough to say, I feel better. This is really easy. And the likelihood of someone injuring themselves is almost zero. So let's, let's dive into that just a little bit more. Cause I, I don't think you and I have ever talked at length about, um, these tools for the youth, for kids. No. Um, you and I have obviously talked about that for adults. Um, so when you're, if you're a parent and obviously you and I are both very vested into getting kids moving. And I think a big part of that is the parents supporting it. This morning I was in the garage with my daughter and recently, uh, you know, my, my son was doing his thing too. And I focus on these big mover movements. This morning, I was doing like some kettlebell high pulls, some jumping pull-ups, and some thrusters. Very, very lightweight, but just working through ranges of motion. And so I guess we talk a lot about the training, but we don't really talk as much about these additional tools. So where would a parent start? Obviously, you know, downloading your app and being able to utilize some of those follow-along tools that you have or discussing like we've talked about, which is the couch stretch and this quad smashing. But in general for kids, where is a good place to start? Or is there no like exact, like, is it in the low back? Is it in the glutes? Is it in the hamstrings? Or is it kind of wherever they're feeling that type of pain? Well, if we're talking about, you know, where to start with a soft tissue mobilization, start with the yes. easy stuff, right? And let me, let me give you a, a big lift here. Kids are very uncomfortable with discomfort. So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can yeah. walk up and down on your quads, Jason, and I've done that to you before. And you're like tapping out. And I'm like, dude, it's still stiff. I'm going to get in here. Right. And yeah. Or mobilizing or, Hey, here, Caroline, put the 70 pound kettlebell on your leg. She's like, Nope, I'm out. Right. So one of the techniques that we've discovered is that if we use a little bit of vibration, mm. it goes a long way. So my favorite roller right now, and full disclosure, I work with hyper ice as a company but they make a small vibrating roller. It's not the big one. It's much smaller in diameter, so it fits a smaller body. But any vibrating roller is a lot more comfortable for kids doing soft tissue work. Because of the vibration, there's a lot happening, 
but some of the signaling about the discomfort is changed and overridden by the vibration. The brain huh. doesn't hear that. And so suddenly kids are like, oh yeah, I can do this. But what I say is let's choose one body part, one body part, and we'll do it on the left side and one body part on the right side. Set a, a, a timer. If this is the first time you've ever done this, get a vibrating one with your kids and set a, a timer for two minutes and get some work in. And then the kid was like, you know, that wasn't so bad. You know, and we did two minutes on the left side and two minutes on the right side. And pretty soon they are like, hey, I'm feeling stiff or I did that and I felt better. And my calf didn't hurt. But you've also got to probably do it with them or guide them through it. If you think, you I mean, do your kids make their bed? Do they like, hey, I'm going to have a salad? You know, they're, they're going to go. So you have to be there and say, hey, look, part of being a human being is knowing how to self-soothe. You're self-soothing with THC and bourbon and red wine and massage and acupuncture. Your kids are just suffering through. When we go to middle schools and high schools and I start asking how many kids are pain-free, very few hands go up. And all the adults are always shocked. All the athletes in there, I'm like, who's got an elbow problem? And then like the starting pitcher raises his hand and the, the coaches are like, what? Your elbow hurts? He's like, yeah, you never asked. I thought it was just normal. Right. So it's shocking when I'm in a group of kids and I'm like, who knows what Seavers disease is? Who knows what Oshkosh Slaughter's is? Like the kids know what all of the common musculoskeletal injuries is for their age group. Right. Shoulders. Who, who's front of the shoulder hurts in swimmers? Every hand goes up. And I'm like, that's crazy. So what we're trying to do here is simply come back to if you're a human being, here's how much range of motion you should have. And all we're doing is saying we want to just keep an eye on these minimums of range of motion so that you can then go do the sport and the training. When something pops or you get something aches, then we can say, hey, that's some information about maybe I'm lacking range of motion or maybe the tissues just need some input, some stiffness. And what we've found is that three to five minutes of really appropriate input there can make a big difference. You can pull out a spatula with a little lotion and rub one direction on your kid's Achilles if their heel hurts a little bit. What are you doing there? Improving blood flow, restoring how tissues are sliding, putting in some non-threatening input. And our experience is that kids re receive that input and they change like that. They're just brought, brought, brains are like, give me more of that. That was it. No problem. And then you could just either do it a few times a week. You could ask, how do you feel today? And turn that into some simple work. But teaching kids young athletes particularly, how to manage their discomfort. It's really important. So let me tell you a story. Caroline. Yeah, no, this is, this is super fascinating for me because I think that we jumped, we jumped this ship from you oh, know, yeah. birth to like, I don't know, 30s, right? <laughs> or, right. Or, whatever. Like, Whoa, I, now I suddenly I care, right? Yeah, 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 right. So there, obviously there's things you can do like, have your kids sit on the floor if you're all watching TV in the evening. Just that, they're going to work on their hip range of motion the whole time. Long sitting, side saddle, squat, 90-90, right? It's, it's the greatest thing you can possibly do for your kids is just to sit on the floor in the evening together. That will go a long way of just touching some of these end range positions. But, you know, Caroline, my 13-year-old, who is a tank, again, in a very tall tank, went to this Olympic training center um, winter camp for water polo where they take a bunch of good kids and they put them in and they did nine two hour sessions for the kids, nine, two hour water polo sessions over in like how many days, three and a half days. Wow. So they're, they're in the pool three, three times a day plus whatever else. And on the, like the third day and Caroline had done a huge water polo thing the week before Car the front of Caroline's shoulder gets hot. Right. And so she had to pop out for the last like half hour of her practice because she's just throwing the ball, throwing the ball, throwing the ball, right, as a goalie. And she went and talked to the physical therapist. And the therapist is like, here's some ice. And Caroline was like, seriously, you're just going to ice it and leave it alone? So she got, a, she got a water polo ball, rolled it back and forth over her shoulder at the, the Olympic Training Center, just did some soft tissue work up against the wall. She, I was like, check your hang shape, Caroline. So she knows that she could just put her hands behind her back, lay on the ground. She did some isometrics there. Then we used this thing called the Mark Pro, which mm -hmm. allowed her to decongest the tissues. All we did was get non-fatiguing muscle contraction, decongest this overlooked tissues, and then boom, she's back. And here's a kid who is alone at a sleepaway camp with shoulder pain, doesn't panic, has a plan, 
to improve the health of the shoulder, get the isometrics on so that she can tell her brain it's safe, restore her soft tissue. Bob's your uncle. And I think what ends up happening is when our kids are in pain, the first thing we do is go to the doctor. And the doctor, it's the wrong reason to go to your doctor. Your doctor is going to say, here's some a, a, a cast. Here's a... And there's times where, of course, if you right. think your child is injured. The anti-inflammatory. Oh, the, yeah. The, go, the go muscle relaxers. Yeah. There are definitely some, some issues around kids where we will injure a growth plate or something's going on. It doesn't smell right, right? Like this smells like we need to get help. But part of our plan is if we're going to teach kids to self-soothe and train, and we're going to train them at the volumes where we are, then mm -hmm. we also have to make sure that they know how to eat and fuel, how to recover, how to protect their sleep. And so now I have a junior who's uh, you know turning 17 in April, and Georgia before water polo games is like, I have to be asleep by 10. And she gets into bed by 10. She's like, because if I don't sleep, I feel like crap. And so she right. kicks her boyfriend out. You know, he's, he doesn't have a game. He's like, let's hang out. And she's like, I got to go to bed at 10. So she kicks him out and, uh, you know, she protects her sleep. So that's, that's what we've got to be doing is not just say, hey, are your kids engaged in an activity? That's great. I think we need to do more sports plus a little formal movement training would be the dream. Now we're doing not many sports or one sport. We have to do a lot more formal movement training. But as parents, we can really support the end. And I get it. It's complicated. Getting Caroline to eat fruits and vegetables and micronutrients is like pulling teeth, right? Like still four, like almost 14 or 13 and a half. And I give her like, I'm like, you got to eat one strawberry for breakfast and this slice of an apple and this emergency on top of her protein and whatever else we're doing. But like some of those battles as a parent, you have to be prepared to have and be able to take care of the system. And that's teaching your kid how to be a lifelong mover. Yeah, the, 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 this is a really, it's a great topic to discuss because like you were saying with your daughter, to be able to, the typical answer is, hey, go ahead and ice and rest. And, I, 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 and you know what, there might be a time and place for that, but more times than not, for you and I have known each other for, I don't know. 15 like years? 15 years. And over the last 15 years, I've gone through a lot of things where I honestly thought that I was like legitimately injured. But you said something, <laughs> I thought that was interesting. Pain is a request for change. I, I actually wrote that down. I find that to be really compelling because I would get these pains in my shoulder, in my elbow, in my knee, in my whatever. And I would, I would actually think like I needed to go and get an MRI and whatnot. But ultimately, that pain was a request for change. And so if we could help our children with these tools um, and, and not make them overly complicated no. or, or, or fancy, I think that yes. we're on to something. I, 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 do, I do wonder what place if any and this is maybe contrary to to maybe what people might be thinking um we've talked in the past about weight training which we could talk about that later but my my one question is in regards to hot and cold therapy what place do you think so if you look at like recovery tools okay yes we have sleep nutrition training but we got to assume all that is already occurring right <laughs> it's not occurring <laughs> like, but we'll but assume it is we got to assume because if you're not there, then we're, like we're trying to, you know, major in the minors here. We got Let, we got focus on that, right? Hang on a second. Let's let's divide this line for people. Yeah. Your kid, if you get seven hours of sleep, that's survival. If you're growing, trying to make gains in performance, or or have pain, and you're trying to stop that, eight hours of sleep is the benchmark minimum. Minimum. That means you need to be in bed for 10, nine hours, a whole nother hour. So if your kids are getting less than eight hours of sleep and they're in sports, that's not a human being. That's a stressed animal that's burning its credits trying to keep up. So just so we're super, super clear on that. Yeah. I don't think people are like, yeah, my kid sleeps. So I'm like, mm, she well, has her phone in her room. She was up till 11 o'clock at night, got up at 630. That's seven hours of sleep or less, right? That's the that no, right. problem. And you know, it's funny, Kelly, because like the kids will go to bed and, you know, school starts relatively early. My kid's school starts at 8, 10, which is not, it doesn't sound that early because I'm up really early, but the kids need to go to bed in an appropriate time. Because, you know, for example, my daughter gets up at six every day with me to go uh, do some walking in the garage. So if she doesn't get to bed by what, 8.30 or whatever it is, she's already behind the eight ball on the amount of hours that she needs. So definitely something to be aware of. Now, so we're talking about training, we're talking about sleep, but we're talking about in particular, this soft tissue work, recovery work. If you look at the different tools you have access to, or at least adults do, 
you and most people do. You have soft tissue work. You have um, this blood flow restriction, which I think is is a little bit. It's probably old school, but I think it's becoming more well yes. known. Right. You have all this. It. You have all this stem stuff, right? And then you have hot cold therapy, and of course, there's many other things as well, right? Compression, this and that. But out of those different tools, which ones do you think are appropriate for kids? Uh, aside from what we've already refer- talked to so far. So we use let's take cold off the table. Cold diminishes circulation. If that's your goal, it numbs things. If that's your goal and it recongests the tissues, it does not evacuate swelling. So it stops healing. If, so if that's your goal, continue to use that ice. And that is well-documented. We use ice when kids who are little kids have like a boo-boo, we give them a placebo ice bag and the ice bag's on there for two seconds and they feel they're, they're gone. Right. So we, we use ice in that way. Yeah, I was thinking um, more like cold plunges and things like that, but yes. So, so getting cold, kids don't like, they're not into that. So, you know, what one of the things we've tried to do in our house is set up the house so that there's lots of options and toys and background noise. But if you have a hot tub, I would say put your kids in the hot tub in the evening. And here's why I would mention that. You can spend a few minutes together. You can set up a bedtime routine that looks the same bedtime routine that the kids used to have when they were kids. First, we take a bath, then we read a book, then we go to bed. So whenever we can, our girls are like, hey, mom, dad, can we all hot tub together for a few minutes? Look, that's something that doesn't scale. I get it. Not everyone can have a hot tub, but improving circulation, they play sports late. We get them home, we slow them down. And throw them in the hot tub after dinner for just 10 or 15 minutes. And we all kind of have a chance to relax and chill. Mm. That helps them to sleep better. If there's looking at all the possible tools and toys and games, I would say if I would have a spatula, you know, like a rubber spatula. So that if a kid had a little hot spot on a tendon or bony interface, you could scrape it one direction for 30 seconds and scrape it the other direction for 30 seconds. And then you can see if it doesn't feel bad to scrape, scrape it again for another 30 seconds. And pretty soon you've done some really explicit work on that tendon to desensitize and improve blood flow. Would I have a vibrating roller? Yes. Why? Because as we said earlier, it's really comfortable for kids to roll. It makes it a lot yeah. easier for kids who are super sensitive. And guess what? We can probably solve 99% of the problems with those two things. A little hot spot. Let's give it a little scrape. Let me show you how to scrape your own shoulder. Yeah. Right. Like here's, a, here's the back end of a butter knife and a little lotion. Right. And then a little bit of soft tissue work. And if you, if you even had a ball, a lacrosse right. ball is probably too hard for your kids. Yeah. Something softer. <clears throat> let them roll around on it. And when they find something that hurts, stop, contract, relax, or – just take five big breaths while you're on that spot. Does it feel better now? Good. Move on. Once 10 minutes is up, you're done. Because what we're trying to do is have what's the minimum effective dose and getting five minutes per side is very reasonable and your kids can stick it out for five minutes. The using the vibration is really interesting. Um, I hadn't thought about it. So my, I have not. Um, yeah, we we have the um, Theragun. I have not used a vibrating um, a roller for the kids. I need to probably get one because, and I'll, I'll share something really unique with you with Ava in particular. If I touch her back to try and do any type of deep tissue any even moderate, she'll get, she'll like start screaming. But if I kind of rub, then it's not a big deal. It, it's based on the way that I touch. It. And, and so the, I'd asked the doctor one time, I said, what's going on with this? And he had said, now this, th- you, you, uh, his reasoning was, Hey, the type of, this is probably an anomaly, but he goes, hey, the type of chemotherapy that she had been on made certain areas of her body and the nerve endings very sensitive. And so in some areas of her body, she'll be much more sensitive than a normal child. That's yeah. what they told me, which I, I don't know. But the point being is like what you just said, though, rega- chemotherapy or not, whatever, is that if you're approaching it one way, but then you maybe hit it with a different angle in this vibration, it could totally change the way the, the skin and the nerves feel it. So I'm, yes. I'm, I'm totally interested in what you said. Yes. And it's okay that some kids have really sensitive areas. Trust them. If they're like, that hurts. We're like, we believe you. Can you take a full right. breath there? Can we change that? And that vibration, you know, we are like you, we have a hypervolt in our living room and our kids, 
something stiff. They're watching TV. They're hanging out. They can grab the hypervolt and do a little bit of work to themselves. Put it, but it's hard for them to massage their backs. Right. Um, you know, hyper ice makes a little vibrating sphere too. You can get a vibrating ball. You can get a vibrating peanut. What you see suddenly is you can throw a towel over this, get your kid lying with their on her back with some vibration. All of a sudden, it's input. So what we're yeah. trying to do here at a fundamental level is tell the brain that it's okay and safe to move, that this input is okay. Mm. And some of that is, so all of these mobilizations and tools or massage could be soft tissue mobilization, or we could look at it as non-threatening input. And really at the first order of business is to tell the brain, these positions are safe and we do that by spending time in the positions. That's why we squat. And that's why we want our kids to hang from pull-up bars and do monkey bars and jump on one leg. These are all just exposure, exposure, exposure. The walking you're doing with the daughter is the most important thing she can be doing that's not exercise or any other thing. Like you have to walk. And that's such a powerful thing. So that's that non-threatening input. But then we can sort of say, well, are you serious that you don't think that tissue stiffness is a problem. I'll tell you it's a problem because we see kids with Seavers disease or Osgood slaughters where their, their tissues are so stiff, they yank on the soft bones and actually create this bony interface problem where we have the connective tissue of the ligament attaching or the tendon attaching to the bone and it gets stressed to that interface. That is super painful. So how do we manage that? Compression, elevation, decongestion, desensitization. Right. What we say is, OK, there are things we can do to change the local environment, which allows the brain to perceive that as a non-threat. And now it's just an easy issue of what are the simplest tools where I'm going to have the best adherence? So my kids are actually going to do it. And when am I going to do it? Otherwise, you and I are arguing about which tool works best for which problem, but none of which your kids do anyway, because they're too busy. Right. The spatula is, you know, hey. Use a butter knife and a spatula, and that's a great component that doesn't cost you really anything. So I'm sure most people have one. Um, and, and so, you know, on that note, how about the hot therapy? Uh, you know, where where is your stance on? And the reason why I think these conversations that you and I are having are important is because I feel like as a parent, uh, you're very invested in your children, and there's a lot of preconceived notions that go into training from years and years and years of just maybe bad information, maybe good information, maybe just an unknown where, oh, a kid shouldn't, you know, touch a weight. Okay. So then one, someone said that years ago and then no one right. touches the weight, but there's no varying degrees or, or whatever. So my question for you would be on the, um, in particular, let's talk about the sauna. So, you know, how about these, for lack of a better term, extreme heats? What's your take on that? What have you seen? Uh, yeah. What's your take? So, Remember that kids don't have as developed cooling and heating systems as everyone else. So guess what? Your child will jump into the sauna and you've got it at 230 degrees and she'll be like, late, I'm out of here. And guess what? That's her brain protecting her, right? right? Being like, this is a threat. So cool it down, have an exposure. And the second your child wants to get out of it, trust her. She, her brain is telling you. Then maybe she jumps in the pool, maybe comes back. You know, so, you know, in terms of hot therapy... I think getting warm at 99 degrees or 100 degrees in a hot tub is easier than suffering at 230 degrees in our sauna with us. As Georgia has gotten older, she has started to spend more time in the sauna. She's adapted and likes, doesn't mind the sauna as much. Caroline will come in and hang out with us but sits on the floor. In terms of heat, heat can be a really powerful analgesic, which is a pain method, right? Which means that you can pull a hot heat blanket out and if, a, if a, one of your kids happens to be, you know, have cramps and have ovaries as part of, of their anatomy, then sometimes they get cramps. And the heat can really help with that because you're improving blood flow and opening up. And, and again, giving information to the brain that blocks the pain signal or interrupts the pain signal. The same thing as vibration. So not only are we going to change heat or improve blood flow, but simultaneously we may be able to confuse or interrupt how the brain is perceiving it. So heat and vibration kind of could be synonymous. So put, put a hot pack on something and it feels great. On a low back that feels a little cooked or on a shoulder, that's infinitely more healthy and helpful. Then 
You might even be able to break spasm or break high tone, which is that musculature holding on and trying to guard with heat, just the same way you feel relaxed out of the sauna or the hot tub. And then massage your kids. Put your thumb on the kid and massage your child. You do not need a, a, a certificate to rub your kid at an appropriate level where they're like, oh, you're a little lighter, dad, and just move across, get some blood flow, get some input in there. These things are the most powerful tools there are. And, you know, we started by saying, hey, you can just put your feet on and massage a little bit with a little pressure, but, you know, elbow and forearms and a little input can go such a long way. I mean, my daughter, Georgia, will just sit up against the, the couch and she'll be like, rub. And she's got, you know, tight traps from swimming and being a, an adult at school and I rub her neck. And how about this? It feels good. And so I think what we try to do is overcomplicate the system. Yeah. But I want the parent of a young active person to be the first musculoskeletal point of care. That Oh, how do you, how does your body feel? Ah, uh, feeling super stiff or my calves are really stiff. Like Caroline broke her ankle this year, had to have ankle surgery. And now her calf gets a little tight because she had ankle surgery and ripped off a chunk of her ankle bone. So I've got to go in there and I just massage her shin and I try to get some infrared. Of course, I'm hoping that she squats and is box jumping and jump roping and playing and doing those things. But sometimes we all need a little bit more input. Or I can say, hey, don't use it, Caroline, right? Just ignore it. Here's some ibuprofen. Like, that's madness, right? right? Would you hand a bunch of bourbon to your kid and be like, drink yourself out of this stupor? Instead, that's what you're doing with ibuprofen. You're just bandaging something. <laughs> I wouldn't... I <laughs> that's a great analogy by the way and uh i would not be handing the, the kids any bourbon but um that's a, that's that's a really great topic i really i'm glad that we we started talking on this particular subject what else do you have going on as of lately i mean you guys look you're you're always active you're always out and about and you, i always feel like you're on the cutting edge of of recovery and, and you're open-minded and so anything that you have seen like for example this um blood flow restriction. Like, what do you think is the next iteration? Cause I mean, if you were to ask me, I don't know when you and I met 15 years ago, you know, what's the key? you're like, well, Hey, let's do a You know, 10 minute squat hold. Okay. All those things I think are still relevant today. Everything that you, you laid a framework for through, you know, legacy mobility wad, I think is still relevant today through the ready set. But as the time has gone on, you've incorporated more tools such as the lacrosse ball, the foam roller, band distraction, uh, you know, voodoo floss. What do you think as the industry evolves, where do you think we're going with that? Not even in particular for kids, just in general, what do you see? Well, what we're seeing right now is this big interruption of who owns what and when are they going to do it? So my doctoral work, as I've said before, is looking at barriers to adherence. What keeps people from doing what they say they want to, they know they should do? And what all of these tools, we break them down in our sort of teaching so that people can have a framework for like, why am I choosing this? What does this do? Does gua sha, does some soft tissue mobilization with a spatula or a, or a scraping tool? Do I do that on everything? Do I scrape my face? Do I scrape my quads? Do I scrape my, no, no, it's, it's an important tool. Where does that tool fit? what we need to do or continue to do is help people make sense of all these different things. Like Norma tech yeah. boots are incredible. They're great, but doesn't scale, right? When do I use it? How often do I use it? Is, is that a pair of Norma tech boots in every pair in, in every house in America? Well, that's not practical. We have kids who are food insecure and kids who don't even have PE. So should we put Norma tech boots in there? Right? So ultimately the revolution and the thing we're working on is, how can we shift the burden of musculoskeletal self-care in this vertically integrated 360 degree approach? We're talking about sleep and getting enough collagen and making sure you get some micronutrients and some protein. How do we integrate that into a whole so that we have better adherence and more importantly, can do that where people are actually living, which is at home. And, and that's really what we continue to focus on is, hey, we, we have a pretty good idea how to improve and train your hip extension so you can win a gold medal in the bobsled. That's a true story. I, like, I know what that's about. I know how to get my bobsled pushers better connected to the bar as they push, right? So, since we're in the middle of the Olymp Winter Olympics. Yeah, but we are. 
I'm interested in saying, well, how can we help you restore your native ability to move and to move freely and effortlessly? And if pain is one of those things, well, let's not just mask it. Let's see if we can improve your range of motion and what tools are available to you to change how your brain is perceiving that. Because ultimately, it all comes back down to moving. Are you moving? Yes or no. All of these things are about returning your ability to move more, more freely. So I'm spending a ton of time there. And then as we get access to more and more tools or as prices come down, as blood flow restriction goes from needing a $5,000 unit to a pair of $100 cuffs to using a $10 voodoo band, well, that means that, hey, maybe that tool becomes a little bit more useful for people trying to make themselves feel better, right? Because you can yeah. wait and see a doctor, a physical therapist every couple of weeks, or you can do something to yourself every night for 10 minutes. There, I do have a question on blood flow restriction because I think that the, the topics that you and I have discussed today for a parent, I don't think are too far reaching if someone, you know, has some basic understanding of, of fitness and, and, and some of these tools, foam roller, you know, uh, you know, trying to break up the tissue, et cetera. But the blood flow restriction, it, unless you're aware of it, um, maybe you could explain a little bit about how that is utilized because, the, and the, and the benefits of it, because now that is becoming more popular yes. uh, and, and there have new products. So traditionally you saw with the quote unquote voodoo plus, which was basically just like a, a long, thin rubber band more or yep. less, but, it, and you would, the way I used to use it and cr please correct me if I'm wrong on this, I would, I would use it. Let's just take on my knee. Let's just say I was having some knee pain or I wanted to kind of just get ready for training. I'd wrap it from the bottom up. I would tie it and I'd work through ranges of motion. And that's just, voodoo, that's voodoo flossing. Voodoo that flossing. Is not blood, that's not blood flow restriction. So, okay. So voodoo flossing is not blood flow restricting. Is, is that correct? So it, it, is, it isn't or what? <laughs> so when we're, when we use compression floss or what we call voodoo floss as yep. we invented it, um, one of the things that we tried to do is we were using it to restore how tissues were sliding locally, how we were impacting how the brain was perceiving a spot that we'd pop it off and blood and hydration would come crashing back into that localized spot. Right. We, we, we were at working at very high compressions, which sometimes even changed, um, you know, how the joint articulated. Right. So the blood flow restriction is done at much lower compressions and you wrap at the only at the top of the shoulder or the top of the hip all the way up in your groin and anything in that that's it anything in that whole kinetic chain the arms or the leg is affected because you are challenging how the blood is moving in and moving out of that tissue and it turns out we can basically and this is I think blood flow restriction really started to gain traction in Japan about 30 years ago. That's how old this is. And they've done millions of blood flow restriction uh, sessions on millions of Japanese people from elderly to youth. How many times, if you look at Katsu, K-A-T-S-U, Katsu, they were the first people to really do any blood flow restriction. They used to call it occlusion therapy. And suddenly you're into like, then you're into Vasper, then you're into, and what you're seeing is that this is a very old idea and it's actually pretty easy to do research on it because we have a physical intervention that's sort of agnostic of, of movement quality. It's just kind of dumb physiology. But what ends up happening is that we're able to get away with much lower loading and much less skilled movement and have a huge biologic, huge physiologic, huge neuro neuroendocrine change. So testosterone spikes, growth hormone kicks out. IGF-1, we start to see upregulation in collagen synthesis, muscle growth. We see less disuse atrophy. We get pain results from it. So it's going to come around where if you're not using blood flow restriction when you have a painful spot, that's a problem. If you're not using a blood flow restriction after a surgery, that's a problem. If you're not using blood flow restriction because you're trying to protect a site but keep it strong and loaded, you're going to see that that's an issue. So what happens is if you like to squat heavy but your knee hurts, I can have the same effects of squatting heavy on your tendons of your quads with this 20% load 
that's done very, very easily. And you don't actually even have to make the pressure of the bands very tight. So I, 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 you know, you have to excuse my uh, lack of knowledge here. So when I'm, when I'm listening to you refer to this, so I, I understand that flossing and blood flow restriction are not the same thing. They have, might have some similar elements, but that's they're right. not the same thing. Not the same thing. And I have done a lot of flossing in different ways through ranges of motion or, or whatnot. I have not done much, if any, blood flow restriction. I actually just got a unit. And when I listen to you talk, it sounds like it's almost like a turning kit. Like, like, a, like it's almost like you're, is, is there a lot of similarities there? But you're obviously not putting as much pressure as you well, would if someone was injuring their leg. For so example. my, what we should be doing is a lot of the systems work at the highest pressures of occlusion. So if I stop blood flow coming in and out, that's occlusion, right? And a lot of the machines will either work at like 80% of occlusion pressure, this loss of pressure, or that we now have done enough of this where you'll see that people are, a lot of the machines have settings of light, medium, and strong, right? Small, medium, and large, where they're getting you mean very, the BFR, like like the blood flow restriction yes. uh, units. Yeah, the units will are set for like you know one, two, or three, and that okay. level three actually maybe only goes up to 180 millimeters of pressure. So even though, like for example, my quad, my hamstrings and quad and glutes occlude, I stop getting blood pressure in there at about blood flow in there at about 220 millimeters of mercury. So if I use a a sphygmometer, like a blood pressure cuff. That's how mm -hmm. we measure the pressure. And I pumped it up to 220. That's how tight I can make it before blood starts being really challenged in and out. But I work at 180. So 40 beats way down. And that's at the high end of the pressure. Mm -hmm. And so we can, what we're finding out is that we don't even need to be n near the like sufferingest Right. You can start you're not so, stopping it. You're just slowing. You're reducing you're slowing it down. And it yep. turns out that changing those hemodynamics, changing how the blood is working and articulating there is enough to cause that signaling of muscle growth. So, I mean, there are bodybuilders. This has been used in the bodybuilding community forever to get huge pumps and to grow muscles. It works really, really well. You want to have gigantic biceps. I cannot recommend blood flow restriction enough. It works so well. And let me give you a simple, there's a lot of, I work with a company I really like. I don't have any getting money from them, but I think their cuffs are the best. They're called occlusion cuffs. Yeah. They're from England. I just, just think that one. they're, they're really simple to use. The basic, these are, these are the guidelines from the physios I work with in premier soccer for the lower extremity or for the upper extremity. We're talking about arms. We go somewhere between 80 and 120. So 80, 100, 120 would be low, medium, and high, right? For the upper body, somewhere between 120 and 100, or sorry, lower body, 120 yep. to 180. So you go 120, 125, 140, 160, somewhere in there, 180. And the first time you do this, make it light. Do some work. See how it feels. You're going to feel like you're dying and you're going to get you're working through ranges of motion during this time. Yes, but it doesn't really matter because it's less about range of motion and more about get a barbell. Like if I pumped you up on your upper body to 180, 160, 180, which sometimes I do, I go a little higher on the upper body because I've done a lot of this. I know my occlusion is a little higher, but if I pumped you up to 160, Jason, and handed you an empty barbell and I said, curl this for 30 seconds. So our model We've tried to simplify this for people. And we say, do 30 seconds of work, then rest for 30 seconds and repeat that five times. And you so, keep the cuffs on the entire time. Yep. And so if I gave you an empty barbell and said, curl this for 15, 30 seconds, you the first 30 seconds, you'd be like, crush this. The next 30 seconds, you'd be like, this is the heaviest barbell I've ever seen. And at the last 30 seconds, you might get six reps of an empty barbell curl. So What's happening is that you're making that environment so toxic. You're creating a ton of lactate in there. Blood flow is getting caught on there. And their system is like, holy crap, look at what's happening here. Kick on all the machinery. And that's one of the things we think happens when you're working at high intensities. The musculature is time under tension, experience the same sort of occlusion-like effect. So again, you could do this on an assault bike. 
How simple is that? Do your arms, do your legs, go 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off. When we use it beforehand, before training, like, you know, I, I have an old knee surgery, so I get my leg pumped up with blood. I go 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off for three minutes. Then I just do my regular thing. But what the rules are, I should always have capillary refill. So if I squeeze it and let it go, blood show should come crashing back in. And I should never have numbness and tingling. How simple is that? And the only thing I would say is if you have changes in your sensation or a blood problem or you're on blood thinner, maybe ask someone for this. But if you're willing to get under a heavy load or you're about to exercise, do a CrossFit class, chances are this is very safe for you. And, I, you know, with my kids, do I use it for them? Yes. And I go very low and they hate it because it's so uncomfortable. Dude, I got to tell you, Kelly, every time I talk to you, so, you know, Every time I talk to you, I, I have questions because of our own children, you know, my own kids, but I, I also, I think that, you know, we need to be open mind. Like, for example, I, I know I text you about this. Like I've been wearing a CGM. I've been trying just a meat diet with a little bit of fruit. I've been trying different things. I'm at a point in my life where I want to try and optimize. I want to feel the best I can for as long yeah. as I can. That's and right. I also want the same thing for my children. I want them to feel the best they can for as long as they can. And I think that we need to continue to have conversations like this because there's a old school way of doing things and there's constantly new evolutions to what's going on. And if you look at it, right, like, I don't know whether it's Chinese herbs or the Japanese and what this uh, blood flow restriction, they've been doing these things in other areas have been doing these things for many, many years. It just might not be as common practice here in the United States or as well known. So we need to keep our eyes open, our ears open. And I yeah, really, you know what I mean? Evidence practice, evidence based when we can. Yes. And then also ask, does this scale? Do I do I have to have 40 cuffs? Maybe it doesn't not scrape for high school, right? And then I also ask, is this what's the principle that's driving on here? Because if I have matches and I'm you're making a fire with matches, and I come over with my lighter, I don't need science to prove that the lighter makes fire. That's called logic, right? It's just I'm using a different technique to solve the same sets of problems. And I think when we ask ourselves better, same or worse, when we ask ourselves observable, measurable, repeatable, when we ask ourselves, is what's the principle that this is working on? Does this facilitate my body's own healing and my own body's own recovery? Then it becomes really simple because we can have the best technique, you know, does everyone going to need a freezer sauna? No, that doesn't really make sense. Like right. do these things scale? You know, if you're at the 1% of the 1% and you have an unlimited budget, there's a lot of fun stuff you can mess around with, but we can probably get a lot of this done first. You know, if you're, if you're worried about when to use your, your compression boots, but you're not walking, you need to start walking first. I mean, that's, right. that's where we are. You know, people are like, show me the secret squirrel program. I'm like, it's called vegetables and fruit and meat. Like, right. let's do that first. And then we can have the next conversation. I love it, man. Well, for anyone listening, uh, for their children, for themselves, uh, visit the Ready State. That's the best place to go check you out and everything. Yeah, ReadyState.com, and you know, um, we Woo! try to be super transparent of what's happening, and uh, you know, we'll keep we'll we'll keep it. If it feels like, you know, you're overwhelmed, just keep in mind that we've never had access to the tools and the communities and the connections and coaches like we have right now. It's taking us a second for the noise is kind of calmed down. Like we've stirred up the, the tank and it's so cloudy with all of this information and TikTok and 15 second fixes and hacks and, and, and the sediment's starting to settle out a little bit and you'll start to see what's really important. Just hang in there. You're part of a great experiment. This Dude, is the first right. generation where we can get it better. That's right. That's why I love this long format. Well, Kelly, you and I, we have to talk again soon. Um, and, uh, do I really appreciate you being on the show chatting with me and, uh, I hope you and the family have a great day, brother. You too. And I'll see you out there walking on your kids. Let's do it.